The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Camping Show. CW gets with you here. It is Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. I have a little announcement to make this evening. Uh, I will be introducing my new co-host next week, Miss Willow Munson, uh, who will be joining me on the show all the way from Casablanca, Morocco. So I'm very excited about, ha about having her here and looking forward to her being on the, uh, uh, on the show, an integral part of the show, as a matter of fact. So um, and I actually think I have fixed a technical problem that has been plaguing me for weeks, if not months. So I think we can safely say, knock on wood, that uh, I shouldn't be popping out of the show uh, tonight. You know, last night I was on, uh, we had a little bit of that last night. I was on Canoe Hounds Adventure Show. Um, the show is from uh, broadcasts out of Ontario, Canada. I believe it's Ontario. Yes. Um, had a great time. A studded uh, cast of guests, star studded, if you will, but it was a great show. Had a wonderful time. And uh, Dennis uh, ended his season two on a very high note. So uh, congratulations to you, Dennis. And a fantastic show you got up there. Um, we have got another great informative show here for you this evening on the camping show. Tonight's episode is our third. And final of our three-part series on outdoor gear, Camping Stoves, is the name of the episode this evening with my special guest, Mr. Cliff Jacobson. Cliff Jacobson is one of North America's most respected outdoors writers and wilderness paddlers. He is a retired environmental science teacher, an outdoor skills instructor, a canoeing and camping consultant, and the author of more than a dozen top-selling books, and a popular video on canoeing and camping. Cliff is a distinguished Eagle Scout, a recipient of the American Canoe Association's prestigious Legends of Paddling Award, and a member of the ACA Hall of Fame. And with that, welcome back to the show, Mr. Cliff. Well, hey, it's, it's great to be <laughs> back. This is the third one in a row. I hope uh, listeners out there can can stand to listen to me one more time. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's, you know what? Everybody said it's a treat to listen to Cliff. I think uh, Johnny Kuehl said it best. He goes, I could listen to Cliff. I would just soak it all up like a sponge, you know. So you uh, definitely are are uh, a wealth of knowledge and, of course, uh, entertaining and delivering it. So uh, kudos to you, sir. Well, hey, thanks, man. Good you bet. Time. You bet. Um, first of all, how's your weather? Are you getting all the rain we're getting here? Yeah, you know, I got some today. I got <laughs> some yesterday. We got a whole total of almost an inch. Oh, wow. We need it there too. Yeah, we we My have doing nothing but but watering the garden, and we yeah. got a huge garden. So yeah, yeah, it's good. It's a lot of work. That is a lot of work. We've had every every rain every day here. I think for at least the past, I'm going to say seven days, if not maybe more. So uh, we've wow. got plenty now. And, and but the beautiful thing about that is we have water to paddle in. No more. Yeah. Pulling yeah, the canoe. You know we, we don't, we we're starting to give up on do, uh, canoeing the Rio Grande River in November because about a week ago it was running at uh, three cubic feet per second, which three? means you walk down it. Wow. Uh, it was up to 5,100 just the other day. It's gone down, but now it's raining again down in Big Bend. Good. So, you know what? Keep the faith. Keep yeah, absolutely. The faith. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't paddle a river you can walk. Well, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> that makes it tough. Um, yeah, well, fingers crossed. Well, before we get into different types, Cliff, uh, designs and applications of camping stoves, let's first have you list each of the applicable fuels along with the pros and the cons of each. Well, you know, it depends what you want. 
You want low cost, high heat, efficiency, you can't beat gas. I mean, actually it's not gasoline, it's white gas, which is which is really a, a refined kind of form of, of naphtha. But the gasoline stove is going to, I mean, you can run a gasoline stove for a fraction of the cost of any of these others, okay? Uh, the downside on the gasoline stove is you have to prime it. You have to pour gas in the tank, and then you have to prime it, and then you have to light it, and then there's a whoosh as it starts up, and some people don't like that. And if, if the stove quits or you turn it off, you got to reprime it and do all that again. Uh, the good news is once you learn how to do this, it's very, very, uh, it doesn't take very long. But uh, basically, a, a, a quart of gas in the stove is going to last probably four hours. Now, you compare that now to, uh, 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 there's butane and propane. Uh, propane is a much better uh, stove fuel than butane simply because it's not affected by uh, temperature, low temperature, or altitude. Um, and you can get it anywhere. These little Coleman cans, they, they're not very expensive. If you're car camping, I got to tell you, it's tough to be propane. You just plug it in and away you go. But if you're self-propelled kind of a camper like I am, you're going to be on a canoe trip out in harm's way, or you're going to be going for a week or more, you know what? You don't want to carry those big, heavy propane cylinders with you. So uh, the, the next step down the line is butane. And we can, we'll can look at some of these stoves in just a little bit. Butane is right now the most popular stove fuel on the planet. Everybody's buying butane stoves. Go into any outdoor store and you're going to see 10 different, 10 more than that, different kinds of butane stoves you might have one gasoline stove for sale in there, maybe two if you're lucky. The advantage of butane is you can get these little cans anywhere. You just plug them in, you turn them on, and away you go. Now, that's the good news about, uh, about butane. The bad news is those stoves work best, first of all, at high altitude. And, the, and manufacturers do a good job of selling that point because they'll show somebody at the top of Mount Everest cooking away, and the attitude is, hey, if it's good enough for Mount Everest, it's good enough for Death Valley. Uh, wrong. As you go up in altitude, okay, uh, the pressure changes, and uh, you have less pressure, so the gas comes out more freely, so you get a lot hotter running stove at high altitude, much more efficient running stove at high altitude than you do at low altitude. All right, so then the re real negative of butane, and we're actually talking about they, they have butane mixes, isobutane. They mix the fuel with, uh, with uh, some other things that take uh, a low temperatures better. But the fact remains, when it gets below freezing, that stove starts slowing down and slowing down, and the colder it gets, the slower it runs. So instead of paying five or six dollars for a little canister of fuel that at normal altitude and, uh, and, uh, and reasonably warm weather, it'll probably run 45 minutes to an hour. You drop that temperature down to 15 or 20 above zero, good luck getting 45 minutes out of that tank. Now, the mm -hmm. other thing is that what happens with these butane stoves is as they run, they get, feel the, feel the tank. You'll see it's getting colder. Sometimes it even gets like snow on it. Now, when that happens, it's cooling down. Now, everybody, everybody learned Boyle's Law back in high school, which means that you heat up a gas, okay, it expands more, you cool it down, it contracts more. So if it gets really cold, doesn't work very well. Now I'll give you I'll give you an interesting example. Uh, a couple of years ago, we canoed the uh, Rio Grande River down on the Texas border, and I had gas. Uh, yes, I had plenty of gasoline because I run strictly gas stoves on these on these trips. And when we got down there, somehow the rumor got started that there was a fire ban in effect. Uh oh. That means I was going to have to use a lot more fuel than I had planned. So I went to the, there's a little store down there in Rio Grande Village, and I checked to say, hey, you got any white gas? No, white gas isn't that easy to find anymore. Well, what do you got? So all we have is we have butane and we have propane. Well, my stove 
that I took would not run propane, but it would run butane by changing the jet around. So I bought a couple cans of that and said, okay, I'm going to just you use that fuel right now while we're in camp because I'm making dinner. Well, big wind came up. It was probably blowing 25 miles an hour, and I was having real problems trying to block off the stove. And so what happened is I'm cooking for a group of four people, and that stove got so cold, it just the, the, the flame just went down, 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 down. So what I did then was I heated up a little pot of water, and I stuck that can down in the hot water, warmed it back up again, whoopee, the flame comes back up again. That's the good news. 28 minutes later, it quit. I'd gone through all the butane in the tank. Now that was $6 for 28 minutes of fuel, okay? So I guess what I'm saying is under ideal conditions, you don't have a big wind, it's not real cold, uh, butane, butane, one of those little one, I think they're one pound cans, will run close to an hour for you if you don't run the thing you know, to totally wide open. But they are expensive fuels. So we got white gas, propane, butane, and then we have some other fuels. We also have alcohol. And I'll show you a picture of the Swedish Trangi, which sort of started the alcohol revolution. And through hikers that do like uh, these major trail systems, uh, Pacific Crest Trail, uh, Appalachian Trail, whatever, they like alcohol stoves. Why? because they weigh next to nothing and you can actually make one in about an hour out of an aluminum pop can. They're, they're actually get pretty hot. Yep. Okay? And you just pour a little alcohol in there. And I would suggest to you, if you have an alcohol stove, don't buy that expensive alcohol you get in the, in the, in the camping shops. Go down to your local gas station and buy a couple cans of heat, H-E-E-T, in the yellow can. I think it burns hotter than those other fuels. And well, I don't know, what does it cost? 79 cents for a can of <laughs> eight, whatever. Anyway, works real well. Um, the bad news about alcohol is it's not very hot. So, for example, my top gasoline stove will boil a quart of water in a covered pot in a little over four minutes. Alcohol is going to take 10. Uh, butane will probably butane will probably take closer to six minutes. Uh, propane will do it in about the same time as my gas stove. So, you know, those are just some things to consider. And finally, the last uh, category, which by the way has really grown in popularity, are wood burning trail stoves. And these are ones that, uh, they actually call them twig stoves because most of them, but not all, will accept twig size stuff, but not stuff that's much bigger. There's a few things to watch out for or to consider if you're going to if you're going to go with one of these wood stoves, and uh, one of them is ash buildup. What do I mean by ash buildup? Well, you've got a closed fuel container. Okay, you've got a closed firebox, and, and it's not very big. It's really small. So as the as it starts burning, that ash falls down into the box below. Pretty soon, it fills up so much the stove quits. Now, there are a few stoves that don't have a base on the bottom. In other words, they either set right on the ground or you can put them in a high-sided aluminum pan. Now, the advantage of that is when you get that ash built up, if you have a pliers or leather man or something like that, you can grab the stove, you can just pick it up a little, shake it a little, get rid of all that ash, and keep on running. Because otherwise, those, they, they fill up pretty quickly with ash, and you're right in the middle of cooking a meal, and all of a sudden, you see this thing smoking, and it's not doing very well. you got to dump the ashes. So that, that pretty much defines all of the current fuels. You might find um, a f an, uh, some of the older stoves that burn kerosene. And kerosene burns pretty hot. It's almost as hot as gasoline. It's got to be primed, which is the bad thing. It also doesn't smell good. It smells bad. Uh, get it on your clothes, get it on your hands. You're not going to like it, but, oh, and it works real well at low temperatures. But the negative is. Um, it's very it, sooty. Uh, it what? It's very sooty. It's, yeah, it, a lot it, of sooty. it is. It, it is sooty and it's slow to start because it's got to be primed. But the good news is it's safer than gas. 
Yeah. So if, you, you're going to, if you're going to start this thing up on a boat, for example, or in a, um, I hate to say it, a vestibular tent, which you really shouldn't do, <laughs> kerosene is a whole lot safer than gasoline. And kerosene won't explode. It'll just burn. Gasoline will explode if you handle it wrong. So no. that's pretty much it. When you're saying gasoline, you are referring to white gas, which is uh, yeah. painters and varnish makers and naphtha. Yeah. Now, I will tell you something. I ran out one time you know where i'm going with this don't you <laughs> and uh we were we had uh we had a short little walk up to the bank and this was a i mean this was a, a developed area and we bought a little gasoline a little right out of the gas pump and we put it in the uh we put it in the canister and we burned that in the stove uh it works but it stinks like hell and uh it's very you know combustible is it the right word combustible flammable whatever but yeah yeah you don't want to burn leaded gasoline in a, a white gas stove you know if you're in a total jam and that's all you have it'll run it mm -hmm. uh, it will be it won't run it real well let's put it that it's going to really it'll carbon up the stove and so forth but hey if it means cooking your dinner or eating it cold <laughs> you know you might want to do that maybe you can throw on uh, that first slide for just a minute i think i yeah, if you can throw in that first picture. All right, I, this is just a picture of some of some of them, and uh, this this is a this is a gasoline stove, okay? And um, this would be I have a current favorite. It's not this one, but the reason why I am showing you this one is because my current favorite hasn't been built for twenty years, okay? This is called the uh, Primus Omnifuel. And uh, this is, if you're gonna go gasoline, this is the hottest of all the stoves. I mean, this baby's really hot. It even is, it even puts out more heat than my favorite, which is the Optimus 111B. But, but the old stoves differ a bit from the new stoves. Let's talk gasoline a minute, and then we'll, we'll run around to the others. And that is their two-part stoves. They have a tank a fuel line, okay, and a burner. Now, it didn't used to be this way. They used to all be self-contained with a tank. And then one day, some clever manufacturer said, hey, you know, everybody reads the annual issue of Backpacker Magazine, and in there they have all these stoves. They're going to be, hikers are going to be looking for the lightest stove. I'll tell you what, let's do. Instead of having an integral tank like we've had for years, let's split it so that we have a tank connected by a fuel hose to the burner. That way we can advertise the weight of the stove without the tank. So notice how light our stove is. Yeah, man, but guess what? You still gotta have a tank. And to put and the two of them together are a whole lot lighter than what you started out with. Not only are they not a whole lot lighter, but they are a lot more problematic. How problematic? Because you've got a fuel line here that has to hook up to the tank. And right inside over here, there is a little ball valve. Now, let me tell you, I've pounded these stoves for decades with parties of 10 and 12 people in the Arctic. And the first thing to fail on one of these stoves is a connector. I don't care who makes it. Every time you connect that thing and disconnect that thing, that's wear and tear. Mm -hmm. I actually had one stove go up in flames with six, literally six foot in the air. I was, I was uh, on the edge of an Ontario lake, and the only thing I could do is I kicked it with my foot into the lake, and that's the only way I could put it out. Otherwise, I, I had a major forest fire. I like, had the same thing happen one time, and it freaked me yeah. out. <laughs> I had, I go, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, it was, it is scary. It is scary. Yeah. And so throw that thing back on again, if you would, uh, that same slide. Now there is a slight advantage to having them separated. And that is if you have a pot on this thing, uh, the heat cannot transfer to the tank and overheat the tank. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing to look for if you are looking for a gasoline stove. You see this long fuel line? Look at how long that is. Now look at this fuel line. Look at how short that is. Sorry, guys, that's too short. 
Yeah. Those of you who maybe have read my book, Canoeing Wild Rivers, fifth edition, in the back there, it talks about a stove that literally exploded. And the guy who was running it was hurt badly enough that he had to be medevaced out. And this wow. was way above the tree line in northern Canada. So you want a very long fuel line. And furthermore, you want this tank shielded from the burner. Now, the other bad thing about this design is there's no built-in windscreen. And if you want to really destroy the efficiency of any stove, just don't have a windscreen. What this thing has, just a piece of a big, huge piece of aluminum foil, heavy-duty aluminum foil, if you will, that goes around the whole thing. It works well. I have to admit, it does work well. But remember, you got to put this thing together. That means you have to screw that in. You've got to open this all up. You've got to put the windscreen on. And then when you're done cooking, you have to take it all apart. And when you do, all these pot supports are going to be carbon black, and you're going to get that all over your hands. Those are just some things that they don't tell you. Now, there's another thing about gasoline stoves that we, we really should deal with. The older stoves, and I'll show you a picture of one in a little bit, had a cleaning device uh, that went up and cleaned that hole in the jet out. And it was a geared cleaning device. You literally turn the knob and this needle came up and cleaned it. Brilliant, okay? Then what happened is they were real expensive stoves. So some engineer got involved and said, you know what? We can make that needle with a steel bottom that's magnetic and we can take a magnet and we can put that underneath the burner and it'll push this thing up and it will clear the jet <laughs> and we don't need the geared needle. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I've had two popular stoves. I'm not gonna tell you what they are both of which from hammering them, in other words, getting them so hot cooking for large groups, that needle literally welded itself into, wow. into the jet. Wow. You could move it with this goofy magnetic thing. So yeah. I would say to you, be wary of a stove that has a magnetic um, clearer or magnetic thing. Cleaner. If I go back to that picture again, if you can go back to that, Okay, this does not have a cleaning device. The, opti the Primus Omnifold does not have a cleaning device. What you use is a little wire. You have to actually get in there with a little wire and you poke down. Now, the bad news is any carbon that's in there is going to be forced down to the bottom of the stove. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like it's more of a problem than it is. And it, I mean, it's that it's not really a, a problem. OK, it's like cleaning the old Primus 71 and the old Sve 123. It's not a big deal. Still, you got to hand clean it. Now, this stove here has a mag these stoves here have these magnets. This has a magnetic cleaning device, which doesn't work very well. And this has what's called a shaker jet. It's the same basic principle. Instead of a magnet, you pick the stove up and you just shake it up and down. And that's supposed to work. Yeah, it will. Until one day, perhaps you hammer this stove and get it so hot that the same thing happens that happened to me. Now, moving along over here. Okay, now this is a butane stove. The, the stove itself is really very tiny and very lightweight. Just screws on to this thing right here. Now, in, now, case, anybody, in case anybody's wondering which one we're on, we're on a little short red can there. Yeah, it's a little red can there. I don't yeah. know if you can see my mouse arrow or not. Can you see my mouse no, arrow? No, no, can't see that. That's why I figure we better point that out. Oh, okay. So, yeah. All right, then. Now, this um, stove actually screws on to the base. This is old-fashioned. Now, most of them have a wire like you see down below here that connects the stove to the tank. Actually, the upright design is better. I'll tell you why. Because you're putting a pot on top. When you put a pot on top, the heat, the heat that's generated from the stove bounces off the pot bottom and keeps this base hot. So mm -hmm. it keeps generating heat even when it's relatively cold but if this thing is connected with a line to here it cools off very fast and is less efficient 
Now, stove makers are going to say to you, no, you don't want this style anymore because you can put a pot on top and it can get so hot it can, it can actually explode. Well, I would say to them, yes, you can. If you're an idiot, you're not watching things, you know, from <laughs> time to time, you want to just, you know, touch this and see how hot it's getting. If it's getting too hot, turn it down a little bit, whatever the case might be. I've never seen one explode because of this situation. But I've seen an awful lot of stoves that just don't work when they're attached to a line like this and they don't generate enough pressure. All right, so that's that one. Now, as we go over here, this is the this is that's the Trangia stove. That's an alcohol burner. This is a it's actually it's called a Trangia storm storm uh, storm burner or storm stove, and it is because the actual stove itself is there's if you look to the far left, you see a little brass thing. As all you do is you fill that baby up with alcohol, you stick it on in the center of this lower base unit here, put the top on, set this thing in there and away you go. You can have a 50 mile an hour wind and this baby won't blow out. I really like the Trangia. If you're going to run alcohol, you can't really beat the Trangia. Yeah. This has been around. Mountain climbers have used it for decades and uh, it's made in Sweden. It's an excellent stove. The only downside is it's a bit on the heavy side. Yeah. So, okay, I think there you, you pretty much have it on, on the stove type. In a, in a little bulky, too. You know, it's it's a little bit bigger. But it does it's have its own built-in windscreen, which is really nice. Oh, yeah, the windscreen's phenomenal. On the, and by the way, the Trangia will also accept a gasoline stove or a propane burner. You can run it through the side. And if it will fit, some of them will fit, some of them don't, you know, you contact Trangia, you go on the, go on the web, whatever, and it'll tell you what yeah. works. Didn't know that. Interesting. Um, well, you answered a couple of questions I have here and I, and I'm, I already know which one's going to come up. Um, <laughs> it, and you've pretty much covered the, what, what, th there's one thing that I want to ask you though, before we go on to this next question, then we're going to take a commercial break. Um, one thing and you and I have talked about this, the old stoves all have metal components and a lot of those metal components have been uh, switched over to plastic. Now, what's wrong with that, Cliff? You know, uh, even my my Primus Omnifuel has all metal parts. Of course, my old Optimus 111B, the Phoebus 625, the Spey 123, all, all those earlier stoves everything was brass or steel mm -hmm. and then they started making plastic stuff and i gotta tell you i can't warm up to plastic parts on a stove <laughs> i mean you have a stove at home and everything around that burner is metal except yeah. for the dial that turns the stove on so why should you make a pump for example out of plastic instead of aluminum answer it's cheaper cheaper period yeah. Yep. That's it. But you know what? If that pump gets hot, it's done. If, if, if anything, as far as I'm concerned, plastic does not belong on the stove. The only place it's acceptable is to, where you grab to turn up the flame and, and turn it down. Even, even that, you're better off not, not to have it. You're better off with something metal. Yeah, Personally, absolutely. I am really put off by plastic parts on trail stoves. I haven't Let, had luck with them. Let's put, and I don't know what number of picture this is, Roxy, but it's the blue, it's the blue box. Can you put that on the screen? Yeah, there we go. Two put two A on. Yeah, this is. Uh, uh, this is my favorite all time stove. This is an Optimus 111B. And if you talk to anybody that owns one, they'll just perk right up and they'll blink their eyes and they'll say, yep, <laughs> all the stoves I've ever used in my life, this is the best stove in the world. It's an awesome stove. These things were never inexpensive. Uh, when this stove was, was new back in the 1960s, it still sold for about $60, somewhere in there. Now, if you can find a new one, oh, which you can't, actually, my buddy Rob Kesselring, some of you may know who he is, did find this for me. He won't tell me where he got it. I'm guessing it had to come from England. But this is a brand new stove. He gave it to me as a present a couple of years ago. I treasure it. I have two older ones that have been hammered for 40 years. They still <laughs> work, but they're tired. But this I, puts out heat like a blowtorch. And what I love about it, you just open this, open the top, 
flip this thing out, prime it, and away you go. When you're done, you push this thing back, push the tank back in, close it up, and, and you're done. So you, you can still buy a 111, okay, stove, but it is not like the ones of 40 years ago. Yeah. No. Uh, I won't mince words. It's junk. What they what they did to this thing, uh, I mean, is a, is a travesty. They got rid of the cleaning jet on it and put some kind of hokey kind of a, a magnetic kind of a deal on it. The whole the stove, it just doesn't work as well as the old ones. They've cheapened everything. They got rid of the brass tank. They went to them. Anyway, if you can find an old 111B and you don't mind the blowtorch roar when it runs, <laughs> it's, it's not only amazing, it never quits, but field maintaining is so simple. Uh, there's not a bunch of extra parts. Um, you know, I yeah uh, I had one of those stoves I told you about it and somebody offered me the right price and I sold it and I and I sold it for three hundred dollars and I kept saying no 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 and then when I said I go okay uh, and you, you know what? Yeah, yes, if it was in a, almost a brand new stove and I knew it was available I would have paid three hundred for it because I, I wish I it was in great shape and I wish I had known that because I would have gladly sold you I will tell you though. You know, they're going to people that are going to go out there and they're going to look up this on the Internet that, you know, Optimus 111B. And but let me let me have you tell them if there were a choice between the new Optimus 111Bs or something like an Omni Fuel by uh, Omni Fuel stove that we had up there before. And I have a couple of those as well. What would you what would you advise them to do between the two? Well, first of all, I would not I would not buy the new 111 at any price for anything. Okay. I hate to diss a manufacturer, but as far as I'm concerned, that stove is junk, and the people I know that have them don't like them either. Uh, the original one was so amazing and so wonderful, I suppose they figured they couldn't bring it back because it was too expensive to do. Yeah. Well, that may well be, but still, nobody has, nobody has built a better stove than that, as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to make a I'll go with another gas stove. It's going to be that Primus Omnifuel. Okay. That'd be my number two. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that stove. I'm going to go back. If you, you can know, put that picture back up here, Roxy, I'm going to point out some. Stove that. too, that's really pretty good. And it's called the uh, the Nova, the Optimus Nova. Um, okay. I actually showed it in the first bunch of pictures. The Nova is okay for a couple of people. It doesn't okay. get hot. Yeah. Well, no, that's not the Nova. That's a first one me running there um the if you can if you go back to slide number uh Be the very first one. one i can show you what the Nova. this is the nova over here on the left okay the far left stove with the little with, with the this far left stove with the short mm -hmm. fuel line is the nova the nova is a pretty good little stove it's pretty reliable it's got that um that uh, magnetic jet cleaner, yeah, yeah. throw that away and just use a little wire to clean it. Uh, one of the advantages of this is, one of the advantages of this, if you look at the trangia, which is in the center of the picture, the big aluminum thing, you can see a hole in the side. This stove is designed with the burners closed up to fit right inside the center of the trangia with that little gas, gas tube coming out through that hole and being hooked up. So that'll work. Now, by the way, though we didn't talk about them, there are some, there are multi fuel stoves. Okay. Let's be, stove, be, yeah. Before we do that, I want to point out something before we forget it. If somebody does find these Optimus 111Bs, well, you want to put that picture back up there, that blue box, that blue stove. This, uh, <clears throat> the gas, the fuel chamber right there, the fuel tank pops forward. Okay. That pops up. And there's also a, um, a shield, a heat shield that goes over that tank, so you don't, so it doesn't, it doesn't heat up, um, you know, and cause. Yeah. You know. And the other thing is, if you find an old 111B, parts are still available for them. Uh, most of the parts though, are coming from England, and I bought complete kits to fix these up. The problem is with anything else. I've fixed them up, I've rebuilt them, but you know, I've been hammering them for 40 years. And they're just tired. It's sort of like an old car that you keep putting parts and keep putting parts in. But you know what? After a while, you just got to completely.
completely overhaul the engine, even if it's running fine. It's just tired. Um, now, just we, want to, we want to talk about the um, the multi-fuel uh, multi stoves. Um, yeah, go ahead and let's do that right now. Well, the one thing that's important to know about multi multi-fuel means it'll burn gasoline, kerosene, JP4, jet fuel, okay, um, propane, butane. This sounds really better on paper than it actually works out <laughs> because, first of all, every one of those fuels requires a different size jet hole in order to meter properly, which means what you have to do is you got to change the jet. It's not that hard, but what it means is you got to take off the burner head, you got to unscrew that little round jet, you got to put the appropriate one back in again. Now, at home, this is not so much of an issue, but if you're out there in the field doing this and you drop this thing in the dirt, guess what? You're out of commission. So, um, you know, a multi fuel sounds great, but, my, but if you're going to burn anything and you want efficiency, just burn white gas and forget it. Otherwise, if you want butane, leave the butane uh, jet in there and just run butane all the time. Okay, but going back and forth is more of a hassle than it's not really a hassle. It's just, do I really want to do this? You know. Well, you know what happens in the summertime when I'll do little summer trips or whatever, and let's just say they're three days long or whatever. I, I, I have taken those. You know, I have taken those little canisters of stuff, but and I'll change that that uh, orifice at home, that little the the jet as you call it, um, and, and that's fine. But if I'm going out when it's cold. Um, there's no way I would take anything but white gas. I <laughs> wouldn't think about it, you know, but, but yeah, you, you don't want to be changing that stuff out in the field. I mean, you take, you go with the fuel that you're going to go with on the trip. You yeah. change that orifice at home and you're good to go. Don't be messing around with the crap. In the, because yeah, if you're going out in the winter. If you're a winter camper, gasoline's it. You don't want to be running butane. Propane. And that's fine. Propane is fine. Mm -hmm. And quest carry it with you on a, backpacking trip or whatever and, and they take a lot of they take a lot of room i mean what you what you can burn in a, in a little tank of gasoline um by far exceeds what you're going to get out of a an lp tank and that's just my opinion would you agree with that yep. yeah all right hey we're going to take uh we're going to take a short break here don't go away we'll be right back with more of the camping show on w4cy radio and talk for tv after this message It is time to go camping. Introducing Campground View's virtual tours. You can tour the campground, see the sites, see if they are available, and click to book your perfect spot. Hit the open road and explore the amazing places found in nature. We make it easy to discover, find, and book your site so that you can go have the fun and freedom you seek. Campground View's virtual tours make it easy and simple for you to see where you are going. And we're back with uh, Cliff Jacobson here on the camping show. Uh, Cliff, I want to ask you a couple questions real quick. We're winding down on about 10 minutes left here, and I want to cover these. Uh, first, real quick question, and this is maybe a one-word answer, but uh, do you carry how, do you carry more than one stove on your trips with you? If I'm going by myself, I carry just one. If I'm going with uh, uh, one or two people, I just do one. If I'm going with more than two, yes, I do carry two, and I actually like to have them both be the same kind. So exactly. if one fails, I can scan. That's not always the case, but uh, yeah, for four more, I carry two stoves. Uh, if you wind up with a fire ban where you can't build a fire uh, and your one stove goes down, you got a problem. Yeah, yeah you do. Um, and you're burning when you got a big group like that. You can burn. You can have two stoves going at once. Just speeds up the cooking. Yeah. Um, so I want to mention this because this is important, and uh, this is something that I learned from you. Um, pot cozies. Uh, closed cell foam pads, um, and oh, and here's something 
you made mention of it in, in one of the books, uh, actually probably a couple of the books. Um, and I, I haven't used one, but I've seen people do it. I'm, I'm a little on the fence about it, like a flame spreader, something that f- spreads a flame out. Uh, give me on those three things that I just mentioned, um, kind of expand on that a little bit, would you please? Okay, well, first of all, a flame spreader is really only useful if you have a blowtorch stove. In other words, a stove that actually has kind of a, what's basically a blowtorch head and you want to spread it out. That's easy enough to do. You just take a tin can lid, stick it on the top, and you got a flame spreader. But otherwise, I otherwise I I've never never used one. As far as cozies are concerned, that that thing developed because I was cooking for ten people on canoe trips above the Arctic Circle, where you're starting with water whose temperature is like forty to forty three degrees, and you got to get it up to boiling and you're trying to, you got a big pot of water, you're going to make spaghetti. You're never going to get that thing to boil at the, at those temperatures. So one day I was in a tea shop and I saw a, a tea cozy and I said, you know what? Grandma's got the right idea. <laughs> so then I developed this whole cozy system of cooking. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can go on my website. There's a blog, I think on there, there's a blog on stoves, to, uh, wood burning stoves anyway uh, uh, testing wood burning stoves i can't remember if there's a blog on how to use this cozy system but you'll find it in my books um camping's top secrets canoeing and camping beyond the basics uh canoeing wild rivers and basic illustrated cooking but what it does it saves a bunch of stove fuel because what you do is you basically take the take the water Put the, put the dehydrated meat in there and the spices. You cozy up the pot and you bring it to a boil. And you can walk away and you'll watch it. And pretty soon you see steam coming up. Then just take this thing off, set it down on a closed cell phone pad because you don't want to get, get it cold from the bottom. Take the top off, give it a stir, put that cozy on top of that. And then if you want to throw a jacket on top of that or whatever, walk away for 20 minutes and your meal will be completely cooked and it will be stay hot enough for seconds and thirds. And you won't be, uh, you'll have stew, not glue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's you a know, quick answer. I even took a, I even took an old yoga mat and cut it up, made a, <laughs> it was here. I was keto. Um, let me ask you, oh, and by the way, those cozies, are great when you cook something and you want to keep that warm. You set that pot on that closed cell foam. You put that cozy over the top around the pan and the stuff stays warm for, for second helpings. So um, are there any special provisions that you take when you pack your fuel, the white gas for a trip? What, what do you, how do you pack it? Do you wrap it in something so it doesn't get punctured? Uh, the, the, the safest way is in an aluminum fuel bottle, which mm-hmm. is a bottle designs just for, liquid fuel. But do you put it in a plastic bag or something in case it leaks yeah, or what do you do? They don't leak. No. Oh, but okay. while we're on the subject is you're smart never to pack any fuel in the same place where you have food or clothing, <laughs> yes. which brings us to, to why you want to have one pack with a couple of side pockets on it. Cause this way you can put that fuel in the side pockets. And if there is a leak or whatever, or there's an odor, you're not going to get it on your stock. Okay. So that's the first thing that I would use. The second thing that you could use is, you know, go down to your discount store and buy a little a one gallon plastic gas can that's certified for gasoline and use that. On our Arctic trips where we have to carry three or four gallons of gasoline, we'll take some of those along because of those little fuel bottles only hold about a quart. Yeah. Um, when we first started doing this, we, we actually carried Coleman fuel in the original cans. And then we would tape them up with tape to keep them from getting damaged. Guess oh, what? Wow. Does not work well. If they <laughs> leak, the, 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 uh, the tape gets all sticky and yucky. No, don't keep it in the original can. Yeah. Um, I've even seen people put them in a thermos. I know, probably not the best idea, but it was what they had. And they go, I, 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 you know, so that's fine. Whatever. Um. How much should someone expect to pay for a quality? Uh, let's talk about the Omni Fuel. That you know, that's kind of both of our favorite, one of our favorites. The Omni Fuel. How much could should somebody expect to go out and pay for a good stove? I'm not sure now. I think I think the Omni Fuel probably runs around 120 bucks. I think the Nova 
is a little bit less. Um, but you know, you're you're paying fifty bucks or sometimes even more for just these little burner heads that run butane. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I would say if you're going, if you're serious about this, just bite the bullet and get the best stove that you can afford. And you know, don't. Uh, just consider the fact that you may have to clean the stove. Consider the fact that if it's tippy, your your meal's gonna your your pot's gonna fall off the top. Okay, it needs a windscreen. Look at this. Look at this thing called windscreen instability. Those are two top things, you know. And if you're and I know we're running short on times, but if you're looking at wood burning stoves, okay, if you go on my 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 website under blogs and you click, just type in wood burning stoves i've tested i think four or five different wood burning stoves up there then tell you and it tells you how they compare for efficiency speed compactness the, the list goes on because we okay. probably don't have time to discuss that here well we got about two minutes and i'm going to flash those pictures that we have remaining and just give them a quick little uh, blurb about each one of them roxy if okay. you want to throw them up there Okay, these are four different wood burning stoves from the left to right. That's the Emberlit stove. It's a very high quality stove made of stainless steel or titanium. Comes apart into four pieces, packs down smaller than a deck of cards. The next one is a Trek stove. That's a Canadian stove, excellent stove. Little bulky, little heavy. The one, the one to the next, next one on the right there is the Little Bug, L-I-T-T-L-B-U-G, Junior. And the one to the right is the Little Bug Senior. These are all wood-burning stoves, okay? Maybe you can flash just a few pictures of them working. That would be, uh, what do we have, uh, photo four or five? Okay, this is the Emberlet. This thing puts out a lot of heat. It's really an excellent stove uses very little fuel. It's a twig stove, won't take big stuff. Now it's a really nice stove, except when you take it apart, then it's carbon black and you're gonna get it all over your hands. And it, in this stove, I know they say you can put this thing together in 15 or 20 seconds. I can't do it that fast. So, okay, what's the next one you got? Okay, this is the Little Bug Senior. I love this thing. This is <laughs> the twig stove. This thing will actually take with up to about three inches in diameter wow. and a foot and a half long. I mean, you can have make a blowtorch out of this thing. Now, wow. if you want to throw, and it packs down to absolutely nothing, it comes apart in two pieces. And if you use it with a high sided pizza pan, it will double as a um, um, as a fire pan if you're canoeing or rafting the Western rivers. The alternative is, is you rent one of these big, heavy 10 pound. Um, fire pans, and whereas this thing weighs a matter of ounces, we, it's a great little stove, L-I-T-T-L-B-U-G dot com. Mm. <clears throat> and if you want to just flip the table on just a minute, here's how they're compared. The Little Bug, to, there's the Little Bug Junior, Senior, Trek Stove, Emberlet, and you can, you can see their size, um, the largest opening, mm. and if you look at the Little Bug Senior, this thing will take... Uh, uh, about four inch diameter wood. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty good. good. Yeah. Okay, you're starting to get it. And as you go down, you can you can you can sort of see uh, the uh, the speed of assembly, and it uses about 20 seconds on the little bug. Uh, the trek, you just put it together. I was kind when I said 30 seconds on the end. Of it. <laughs> people who have one can do it that fast. Sorry, I I I can't. And yeah. stability, you can see where the stability is. The truck stove is one, the Emberlet's next, and these are le a little less stable. So these are just some things to consider, except one final comment on this. If you carry a wood-burning stove in federal land, you better have a butane, propane, or gas stove with you. Because if there's a fire ban, wood stove yes, doesn't put yeah. you down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. That's a very good point. You'll keep somebody, yeah, somebody's yeah. butt out of trouble because, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's like having the smoking gun in your hand, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. And oh, by the way, the, some of these wood stoves can also be run on uh, alcohol. If you have a little alcohol burner, you can just stick it right inside the stove and you can you can run off of alcohol. Good so point. Good point. 
Um, very good. Roxy, why don't you put that picture up there, the last one we've got um, of uh, Cliff's book, number eight. Uh, be sure to get your copy of Cliff Jacobson's latest book, Justin Cody's Race to Survival, as well as Cliff's weekly blog posts, along with all of the information on camping and canoeing provided on his website, www.cliffcanoe.com. So, Cliff, I want to thank you for uh, being my guest uh, for this entertaining and informative three-part series on the camping show. It was an honor and a pleasure having you here with us. Al, it was an honor and a pleasure to be with you, CJ. Steve, well, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate and, that. And it, yeah, this is uh, this is. All, a great uh, thank you for listening. To thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, be sure to tune in for next week's episode, Introduction to Whitewater Kayak, and with special guests Dan Bowers and Colin Kemp. Once again, thank you for tuning into The Camping Show. This is C.W. Getz reminding you, learn more, do more. See you next week. <laughs>